It's now my sincere honor to introduce our next keynote. And this is someone who I still can't believe he actually knows my name um, because I've admired him really my whole life. Um, for me and a whole generation of food and agriculture advocates, Fred Kirschman is our hero. For more than 40 years, he's been proving that agroecological farming systems can feed the world. He is currently the president of the board of Stone Barns Center, and he is a distinguished fellow at the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture. But he has served, as, as I mentioned before, as a mentor for many of us throughout the years. And it's his writing and his speaking engagements that give me hope, even when there has, hasn't been a lot to be hopeful about over the last few years. I'm so incredibly grateful to him and his work and, and so uh, happy to call him a friend. He's also married to one of my very favorite people in the world, Carolyn Raffensperger, who heads the Science and Environmental Health Network. So um, after Fred speaks, Roger Thoreau will be moderating the Farming the Future panel. Please join me in welcoming Fred Kirschman to the stage. Wow, thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today. And um, I have to admit that this is the first I've been asked to do a keynote in seven minutes. So, uh, And it, it, it reminded me of one of my favorite comments by uh, 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 a, a dear friend of mine uh, who you will recognize, who and once he gave a 10-minute talk. And at the end of the talk, he said, now, if I had a little more time, I could have done a shorter one. Uh, <laughs> That, that was Mark Twain. Uh, anyway, uh, in the brief time that I have, uh, and I want to say that I'm really glad that uh, the theme of uh, this panel is farming the future, because uh, in my experience, and I've been involved in sustainable agriculture for 40 years, uh, we have not really paid that much attention to the future challenges that we're going to be facing. We primarily have looked at sustainability in terms of how to make the current system a little less unsustainable. Uh, and that's not going to get us to where we need to go because we're going to see some significant changes. And so what I want to do is focus primarily on two things. And, and, and as you will uh, understand, my focus is going to be primarily on farming, not on the whole food system. And I agree with Kevin that our whole food system is broken, but it's also broken at the farm. And so the two areas that I think we need to focus on more as we think seriously about sustainability is our ecological future and our social and economic future. And the reason that the ecological future is so important is because now for over a century, uh, our farming system has primarily been operating on the basis of the cheap inputs that we've had to sustain the system. There has been no emphasis on restoring the biological health of soil, which I will point out is one of the key things we need to look at now, especially as we face our future challenges. But we've had all of these cheap inputs, and what are they? Well, they've been fossil fuels, of course, which supplies the energy. And our current food system is the least energy efficiency that we've ever had. It now takes 10 to 12 kilocalories of energy to put one kilocalorie of food on our tables. And the only reason that we've been able to do that is because we've had all this cheap energy, the cheap fossil fuels. And then we've had the cheap minerals, you know, the phosphorus, the, 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 the big three, N, P, and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash. And, uh, and if you think about this simply in terms of uh, phosphorus, you know, our phosphorus comes from rock phosphate, which is a mined source. And there are only four countries that still have rock phosphate reserves, the United States being one of them. And by all of the uh, analysts that I've studied, at the rate that we're mining rock phosphate now, there's only rock phosphate reserves left in the United States at most 20 years, and some say probably no more than 10 years. And of course, that means that the cost of phosphorus is going up. Back in the 60s, farmers were buying phosphorus for $60 a ton. Now it's $700 a ton. And as you look at the next 10 years when we're going to deplete those resources, and I'm not going to try to predict the future because none of us are very good at predicting, uh, but we can anticipate uh, that they could go to $2,500 a ton, even more than that. At some point, that's simply not going to be affordable. So if you think about crude oil at $350 a barrel and rock phosphate 
uh, or as a phosphorus at $2,500 a ton. And then you've got, we're also depleting the metal resources which are going into all of the machinery and equipment that we use. Uh, and then also there's fossil water, which is also a non-renewable resource, and we've been draining our fresh water resources. Uh, the Ogallala Aquifer, for example, which provides much of the irrigation water in the heartland. Uh, and again, in terms of all the studies I've seen, at the rate that we're drawing down the water in the Ogallala Aquifer, there's only going to be uh, irrigation water there at most for 20 years. And again, some people say maybe no more than 10 years. And then you finally have soil, and we've always thought of soil as not being a non-renewable resources. But if you think about it in terms of the long history, uh, it took nature millions of years to accumulate the soil that's on our that's on our that's on our land. And even in places like Iowa, which has some of the richest soil in the world, we've lost six inches of topsoil just since 1960, given the way that we're farming. And then it's not only the erosion of our soil, it's also the degradation of our soil. The soil no longer has that life and living capacity. Soil is not just dirt. Soil is a living uh, substance. And, and uh, as science, soil, soil scientists haven't even been able to figure out exactly how many microbes there are in a single teaspoonful of soil. Some say maybe 500 million. Some say maybe as many as a billion. This is a living substance. And we have to feed that living substance if we're going to. Um, so the key thing that we really have to think about if we want to think about a food system at the farm level that's sustainable is how do we restore the biological health of soil. And in this regard, there are a number of resources that I would highly recommend to you. And one of them is a, a new book that just came out last November uh, by David Montgomery and his wife, Ann Bickle, entitled The Hidden Half of Nature. And this is the first study that I've seen that goes into great detail about all of the microbes in the soil and how it's the microbes in the soil that then in turn feed the microbes in our gut so our human health is directly related to the health in the soil. Uh, and now uh, David Montgomery has just uh, finished a new book which is not available in published formula. This is a pre-publication uh, uh, called Growing a Revolution. And the revolution that he talks about is the revolution that we now need to engage in in terms of restoring the biological health of our soil. And he goes into great, and he, and he features a lot of farmers who are already doing this in terms of the kind of conservation practices that they're using. But farmers are beginning to recognize that as these input costs go up and as they no longer have uh, all of those cheap inputs, they have to begin looking at restoring the biological health of soil. And all across the country, there are farmers that are beginning to do that. So that's part of the, part of the hopefulness. The other thing that I want to mention, which is really in the longer term future, absolutely critical, because a lot of things that farmers are doing now, like planting cover crops, et cetera, to restore the biological health, these are all important. But ultimately, we have to look at the kind of thing uh, that Fred Yutzi is going to talk to us about is the final keynote today, and that's the perennials, which the Land Institute has been working on. Because when you have perennials, you have deep-rooted systems. You, ha you, don't, you don't disturb the soil every so often. It, uh, perennials grow on their own, and the perennial polycultures, that's actually the community that the microbes need to restore the biological health of soil. And then in terms of the social economic system, and I'm uh, out of time here now, so I'm going on just a little bit, but here's another resource I would highly recommend to you that also just came out last November, and that's John Takara's new book entitled How to Thrive in the Next Economy. And what John Takara points out based on his travels around the world, and this is the good news, he is now discovering that there's already a new economy emerging that he calls bioregionalism. So this isn't about local anymore. Local is about how, food, how far food travels. Bioregionalism is about how we put together a system in which uh, the economy, which people collaborate together in their own ecological regions and decide how, and, and the, the, the definition of growth is no longer unlimited economic growth. The definition of growth is uh, how to uh, restore the life on Earth. That's the concept of growth growth for these communities. And the, the exciting thing is that he's seeing these bioregional economies already developing all around the world. And so that's a, a very positive thing for us to look at. So to finish, uh, I think the kind of transition that we need to make now is from a past 
that we've come from, which is maximum efficient production for short-term economic return. And every farmer felt that's what they had to do if they were going to be successful. We're now transitioning to a future where it's about what I call the three R's. Regenerative, how do we Re re regenerate the resources that we're using in the process of using them. And we know how to do that. We have a long history about that. That's a transition we have to make. And the second R is resilient, and especially as you add climate change in the situation, and every farmer knows uh, that the weather patterns are an important factor of their success, and we're not going to have those stable weather factors in the future. So how are we going to put together a resilient system, and that's more diverse systems. The more diverse they are, the more resilient they are. And then the third is about relationships. We can't simply ask farmers to make these transitions themselves. We have to transition the food system and a food system that supports farmers in making these kinds of transition uh, in our future uh, on behalf of all of us. Uh, so that's the kind of direction I think we need to go in.